Welcome back to Straight Talk with Vijay Narayan on Fiji Village. And uh, it is a pleasure to have uh, the head of the vaccination task force of the health ministry, Dr. Rachel Devi, uh, with us uh, this morning. Dr. Rachel, first of all, thank you very much uh, for making our time uh, during your busy schedule to talk to our listeners and our users this morning. Thank you, Vijay. It's always a pleasure because, uh, you know, we're in this fight together and we really want the right information going out to every Fijian out there. Listen. Dr. Rachel, since we last spoke, uh, of course, you had set some targets uh, and you had said that uh, uh, more doses will be coming from Australia, 70,000 doses in total. And uh, of course, uh, we were expecting more people getting second doses a uh, total of about 59,000 you're saying were due for second doses uh, from last week onwards. So how has vaccination gone so far? Thank you, Vijay. Yes, an important question for Fiji in terms of where we are, how we're doing, and uh, what's our stats like uh, in terms of vaccination roller. So yes, we did get the 70,000 last weekend. Uh, I mean, in two batches, 20,000 and the 50,000 in the weekend last week. And then we anticipate another batch of around um, I think 65,000 or so uh, vaccines coming in from Australia. Uh, so we, like we mentioned, we did roll out, uh, we did start off with our second jab for those individuals who had received the COVID shield AstraZeneca from India. And um, uh, we, since then we have increased significantly in terms of our second dose, we've done 27,654 individuals who've been fully vaccinated now. Um, and uh, 262,155, 151 individuals um, having gotten their second, uh, first jab in Fiji. So it's a good number, but I know there is still, um, um, we haven't reached even our 50% target uh, of our targeted population. So it's important that we keep persevering on this. And uh, more importantly, that um, those individuals who are now due for their second dose come forth for um, this vaccination so that uh, that just makes us fully vaccinated and um, significantly protected. Thank you. Dr. Rachel, uh, based on uh, supply coming in, how is your vaccination rate and supply being managed at the moment? Jay, that's, a, that's an important that has been um, an important part of our whole vaccination rollout program because our vaccination rollout program is solely dependent on what's available in the country. And I must say, I'm really thankful to the Australian government and uh, soon we're also organizing things with the New Zealand government uh, with N um, both DFED and FED in getting more vaccines into the country. And uh, basically what's happened is um, depending on what was available in the country is how we've rolled out to, the, to every part of the country. And we know we started off with a small containment area within the Suvanasori corridor. Then we expanded to the greater Viti Levu areas. And then um, now, as of this week, we have managed to step into Vanua Levu and uh, get a good um, amount of vaccines across there. And I think um, we're in a better position to keep supplying them with vaccines. Um, and um, we're almost ending towards June, finishing off with June. So. Um, I think we we are anticipating a constant supply to the north, and hopefully we can supply a portion of vaccines to the eastern division as well. Though we do understand the eastern division is always uh, geographically challenged and capacity there is um, not so significant, but um, but we will definitely uh, strategize to ensure that uh, every eligible Fijian is uh, vaccinated out there. So in terms of supply and the rollout, it's going well, it's getting better. And uh, on an average, we did see close to um, 30,000, between 30 to 70,000 a week that we were jabbing individuals. And this was initially with first doses. Now we're similarly doing about 30,000, 30 to 40,000 a week with both dose one and dose two which is a huge number. So uh, I think um, I think that's good, but we need to just continue and be persevering in this um, in this fight against COVID-19 in Fiji. To Rachel, some questions continue to come up from the ground. And of course, this is the place where we get uh, factual information out, debunk all the myths that are being circulated and uh, continue to ensure that all the disinformation is addressed. One of the issues uh, that uh, has started to develop and uh, being widely shared is about the issue regarding 
how was this vaccine developed and a lot of uh, false information surrounding it. If you can clear the air for our users and listeners, please. Sure, absolutely, Vijay. I mean, this, that's an important question. And honestly, everybody obviously has a right to know that information because, uh, you know, one of the biggest things is some diseases even to date don't have a vaccine because um, they haven't been able to make a breakthrough in that area. But, uh, you know, uh, a number of diseases have gotten vaccines uh, developed now. I think the most recent one apart from COVID was malaria and a few other ones. But uh, having said that, vaccination development takes a process. It's a stepwise process. And this step almost includes almost three phases of it where obviously the development of the vaccine happens and before it's even tested on humans, it's trialed on the animals. And uh, once that's done and it's uh, seen to be okay, and then that's when they step up to um, uh, trial, doing clinical trials in humans. So one of the things that had happened with these vaccines is when in the whole expedited process, um, like I said, there's three different phases of things, and there is a certain amount of population it is uh, um, or studied on. And when we do these studies, um, for example, we look at the Pfizer vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine. That study would have taken place in a certain group of population, like 20, 30, 40,000 individuals being um, jabbed with dose one and, and a certain amount of that dose, for example, 0 0.5 mil, 0 0.25 mil, um, all those things are considered. And uh, once, um, uh, and in that study, as it progressed, the results tell us how to progress better and what's the effectiveness of that vaccine, the efficacy of it, and uh, how best to progress it. And the biggest thing is the safety of the vaccine. What are the side effects of it and what are the outcomes of things? Has there been any adverse event? So for those clinical trials, every individual that gets into that clinical trial knows about it and signs off on it. And I know sometimes people have said, oh, we don't want to be guinea pigs in PG. We don't want to be another group of vaccine trials. No, there is no vaccination trial going on Fiji. I must say there's millions and millions of vaccines of, um, that's been already administered right across the world before even it came to Fiji. So basically, yes, like three phases of um, trials uh, that happen. And once we complete those three phases of trials by that particular um, group of uh, scientists um, and um, uh, organization, for example, AstraZeneca, once that was done, um, a country, uh, that result again goes to the country's regulatory systems. Um, for example, if I give you UK, uh, UK one was one of the first countries in the world to have started their vaccination, um, um, I think uh, in December. So with that, when they started, before they started, this data would have gone to that regulatory authority. This is another group of, a separate group of individuals who assess the data, look at the numbers, crunch the numbers again, and say, okay, this is safe for us now. Um, and then they okay to administer it amongst their population. So that's what UK did, and that's when progressively FDA, the American um, American did, and uh, gradually everyone's done the same. And in that process, we've got to be mindful. In December, the these data was getting to WHO. Now, with the countries whose regulatory systems, for instance, we don't have scientists um, who can crunch those data, look at these vaccine content, et cetera. WHO does a lot of that tasks for us developing countries in that context. So WHO looks at, looks at the data, looks at the credibility of things and uh, gets things moving. So when they have looked at all these data, they approve. This is a whole group of technical people coming together, scientists, uh, epidemiologists, public health specialists, et cetera. Um, and they look at the data and certify it to be good to be uh, under the emergency use listing for WHO or not. Once that is done and um, that process is followed, uh, then they release it and they let the world know, okay, we've uh, WHO has done this. And then countries uh, like us, we uh, pick it up from there and then we progress on it. That's one of the reasons why um, AstraZeneca, when it was being uh, developed, 
it gradually when it as soon as it got the endorsement that's when it came to the COVAX facility and it was um, uh, distributed equally to all countries including the Pacific. So one thing I can say is that, that the three phases of clinical trials for any vaccine development was followed, every single phase of it. There was no single compromise in those uh, processes. And once that was done and proven safe and effective for use was that's when it was released for utilization for uh, inoculations in individuals. And, um, and uh, that was one of the, that's something important that we do need to know that um, no compromise at all was done in the, in the whole process of development. Dr. Rachel, the other issue that uh, some people are raising, uh, why develop a vaccine uh, when uh, you could not come up with a cure? What's your comment on that? You know, uh, Vijay, this is something that we, we do need to know. Now, if you look at it, um, there's a few diseases out there that don't have a cure for it, but have vaccines. For example, like uh, when we look at uh, vaccines, vaccines is a preventative measure. It prevents you and uh, prevents you from getting sick, prevents you from getting that illness. Um, now, with this COVID-19 vaccines, it's a preventative measure again. It's, a, I think, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned with you, but I have mentioned in previous other places that um, vaccine is one of the most studied, um, sophisticated aspect of a public health response globally. We've eradicated so many diseases with vaccines. Uh, we've uh, controlled it, we've eliminated it. So there's a lot of um, work that has gone in vaccines. And that's one of the reasons why we, when this virus came about, we knew the, that apart from the normal mitigation strategies, vaccination was one of the key to it. Because uh, we already know there is no specific treatment for it, so um, um, and uh, and we know that now vaccines work. So um, that's one of the important things. The credibility of vaccines is that it reduces significant amount of disease, the burden in itself. And I must say, the vaccines for COVID nineteen does similarly. Um, I mean, it's the same thing. And uh, when we talk about it, it may, may not prevent getting the disease, but it surely does prevent you from severe illness, from dying, from hospitalization, from the extreme of things. And um, we know that we've already seen more than I believe uh, mil I mean, millions of deaths right across the world with COVID-19. And we constantly see it, even in Fiji, we've seen a few deaths. While this few, but this few is a number for Fiji. It, it is still a number and that's too much. Dr. Rachel, the other question keeps coming up by, uh, from some uh, is uh, why Fiji is not getting Pfizer or Moderna? Why, why Fiji is getting AstraZeneca? It's an, a good question, an important one as well. Um, so Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, even the Janssen vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson one, and um, quite a number of other vaccines that have been developed have been um, um, out there. And I must say, I think only four or five of them are in the WHO is emergency use listing now. Um, but you know, we've got to be mindful, there's like hundreds of vaccines out there right now being developed. But only that which has proven to be safe was what was um, has been endorsed by WHO. Now, for Fiji, why did we choose AstraZeneca and not Pfizer and Moderna and the others? So basically, what had happened was, we obviously uh, were ready to take on Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Moderna, which was coming, whichever would have come our way. Now, with these things, manufacturers are limited, supply, thus supply is limited. Um, now, for instance, with Pfizer, the, the storage capacity, while it was, the, the storage capacity for uh, Pfizer is minus 80 meaning we need minus 80 storage capacity to store all our vaccines. Um, while we didn't have it, we, uh, um, we knew we could have that capacity of storing it. We had a few minus 80 fridges and we, could have, uh, we would have purchased more if we needed it. But unfortunately, when Pfizer was being made available to Fiji, uh, Fiji's, we did not have cases in Fiji, thus they were redirected to other countries um, and which was deemed to priority through the COVAX facility. 
Um, and um, this is the COVAX facility is basically the arm of the vac vaccination arm in the COVID-19 pandemic. That's what COVAX facility is. Now, that arm in itself uh, redistributed vaccines according to the need in the, in the countries. And we know, we know hundreds and thousands of people were dying in so many developing countries and developed countries, thus redirected to places that really needed it to prevent those deaths. And uh, when um, vaccines were made available, and that's when AstraZeneca was the second uh, vaccine that got um, WHO um, listing, like under the emergency use listing. Uh, thus, and they had a number of manufacturing plants as well. Um, thus, that was offered to Fiji, and uh, uh, despite not having much cases, it was um, it was offered to Fiji in, in terms from the equitable access, like as an equal access to any country, including developing countries like us. So, with that equitable access, we were given AstraZeneca, and soon after that, I think. Um, um, India even offered the AstraZeneca vaccine and uh, and now since there's a manufacturing plant in Australia, they've even offered us the AstraZeneca, which kind of fits in well for our program in terms of the rollout. And apart from that, like I mentioned, Pfizer and Moderna have an ultra cold chain capacity requirement. AstraZeneca falls in very well with our existing vaccination program for children. For example, the AstraZeneca vaccine is stored in plus two to plus eight uh, storage capacity. And it falls very well into that storage capacity and the cold chain aspect of um, storing vaccines. Because if you've ever, if you, when you would have been to the vaccination sites, you would have seen a box, a blue kind of box that stores the vaccines. Now those boxes actually have ice packs and the heartbeat of vaccination is the cold chain capacity of it of it. And for any country to have received vaccines, we needed to be rest assured that our cold chain capacity was strong. And Fiji, we know we've got very good cold chain capacity. We've got very good immunization program from, from before where we've, where we've had uh, 95 plus vaccination coverages for other diseases such as measles and, and so many others. So um, it AstraZeneca fell right within the whole um, immunization system, we say in, in Fiji, so that um, that uh, that kind of just roll into place for us. Your discussion is still underway in relation to uh, vaccination for children. Uh, WHO's assessment on that? Yes, those are those are discussions. I believe we will eventually have when um, when we would have uh, finished and or maybe progressing better with the target population with the um, with the adults because we know that uh, majority of the infection literally affects those um, older population uh, with uh, especially with comorbid issues, which makes them vulnerable. While deaths globally haven't been significant, um, a minority amongst, um, amongst them, uh, children, we needed to prioritize this population first, but definitely we will be exploring vaccines um, uh, where possible. Um, and uh, which is safe, proven safe for uh, children as well. So um, I think with uh, all the studies going around, uh, we, we will eventually know what uh, the direction uh, vaccines give us. I know Pfizer has already been endorsed for um, 12 to 16, uh, 12 to 18, sorry. Pfizer is already originally given to 16 years and above, and now they are giving it, administering it uh, with 12 to 16 in certain countries. I know US, America, uh, US and Canada and a few, I think UK have probably moved in that direction and a few others as well. So we definitely will explore that um, because ultimately we are seeing a good number of children being affected by COVID in Fiji as well. There is a small proportion, but there is a proportion of uh, um, even, you know, uh, toddlers being affected by COVID. So, yeah, I think we, to protect our Fijians, our children as well, we need to, uh, be a bit more proactive in this. There's some people who are getting mixed up with a number of videos still being circulated on uh, social media and just relying on that information, uh, which seems to be a real concern to, uh, to a number of people. Uh, there's one that came up to said, I've just got information from the videos that I've got and COVID-19 is a lie, and this is just to get these uh, shots into the arms of people, 
your comments to those people who may be watching this video? I think, um, yeah, I, I think I've even personally seen a few of those things on social media that COVID is a whole lie, hoax and everything. But I think, you know, it doesn't take us too far for us to see reality. It's just in our doorstep. Um, we've had COVID-19 deaths in Fiji. We've um, had COVID-19 deaths in the Pacific. Um, PNG is a good example where people were literally uh, dying in the car parks and, um, you know, um, couldn't get to the hospital or dying elsewhere. So, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine how more real could uh, things be. And we've, we've seen um, um, crematoriums in, um, in India, in parks where kids used to play. We've seen those um, those videos. With it's it's obviously sad. I, th I think when it was shared, it was um, it was moments that I think um, no none of us wanted to see because we don't want to be at that stage and um, or even want to see anything like that in Fiji for sure. So, you know, how more real could it be? I can't imagine what people need to uh, see and believe. But I think we as Fijians need to take heed of what's happened globally and uh, take heed of it and contextualize it locally, bring it to our local context and see it. We're getting hundreds of cases a day. It's, it's, not, uh, it's no joke. It's, um, um, we're holding on right now, but, uh, but we need um, all Fijians to be doing this together, honestly. We're seeing communities being affected, going into lockdowns. We're seeing, um, you know, uh, we are seeing deaths, unfortunately, from COVID-19. So um, how more real could this be? And to top it off, globalization has come to a standstill with this pandemic, where we could travel to a country in less than 24 hours. We can't even do that. And it's been months. It's been more than a year. We haven't been able to do that. Um, if this is no joke and people have lost their jobs, um, uh, you know, people are going hungry. So much is happening. So. Um, I think we need to do a rain check on realities like, okay, um, should I, don't believe those videos in terms of that because see what's in the news, what's credible. Go back to the credible sources of information rather than believing any Tom, Dick and Harry out there in terms of what's happening um, is just a hoax because it's, it's not, it's reality. And that's why flying so much in the country, our people are at home for almost more than two weeks, two months. So uh, that's, reality is just here at home in Fiji. That's what I'd say. Just look at our door and, uh, next doorstep and, and it's there. So just be careful. Dr. Rachel, uh, also uh, your officials, your teams, uh, go through every day huge risks uh, in the community to try to get uh, the doses in the arms of people. Uh, you've had uh, cases where people have been exposed uh, at vaccination uh, sites. Uh, how are you coping with that so far? So, um, you, know, you know, the risk with healthcare workers and not just healthcare workers right now, frontliners, even our volunteers, it, the risk is huge out there. But, um, you know, we've, um, we've definitely stepped up and made sure that our people are protected first as well. Because when we are protected, we, are, um, we have our respective like protective gears that we, that we wear like gowns and uh, masks, face shields and all that. Uh, we know we are protected. And because that we honestly, at this point in time, we need to keep going. Um, if we stop, it's going to... Um, it's going to be, um, uh, I, can, I can't imagine, but, I, but it's going to be uh, not so nice because we don't want to stop this vaccination. We, don't, we can't stop containing this virus. Uh, we have to continue with it. We have to be release, resilient people to just continue with it because um, that's important for not just for us, but for the country in itself. And uh, we know medical space is a technical, it is a technical space as well. So uh, we've, while we've got qualifications, we definitely take oath to uh, protect the country, protect every individual. So that's essential for us. Um, so because we know even within the vaccination teams, we've had a few teams that uh, had to step down because there were, um, there were, there were positive cases um, that they were primary contacts of. And uh, 
but uh, I must say they they finished off their term of uh, isolating, um, you know, getting all the swabs necessary, check done, and they're back on again. And um, the moment they're back on and they just hit the ground and then keep running, because um, that's what we are here to do. We are here to reach that our, our target population of vaccination, per se, and um, and then make sure our people are protected because the last thing we really want to see is when there's a vaccine available, why die from a disease when the vaccine's available? I mean, that's one thing I'd like to just say. It's like, that's, I guess that's, um, that's one of the things that keeps us going as, uh, as healthcare workers, as frontliners. But Rachel, uh, what keeps your team members motivated and encouraged on a daily basis? That's a good question. Um, I think, um, like I mentioned, I think, uh, you know, it, it, the target is a number, but, you know, protecting individuals is of essence. Um, and uh, I must say there have been so many people praying. We, we share encouraging messages with each other. We share, um, uh, you know, encouraging words um, uh, within the teams, within our Viber groups to keep it going. And, you um, Knowing that this will come come to an end soon, when um, you know, when we once we've protected people, and we then in that sustainability mode. So, and the team effort, I must say, you know, the team effort, the team's resilience is amazing. Um, I must say, I, I'm, I applaud the team on the ground. They just keep going despite you know the, the um, misinformation that's been going around. It's um, it uh, slowed the the move the move in terms of the first doses for us a bit. Even uh, some of uh, were even hesitant for the second dose, but um, but we've been persistent. We want the well, we wanted to get the right information out. So I think uh, those things discourage us sometimes, but um, but we have to fight this fight, and that's one thing that. Um, um, that we that we know, and that's a, there's a heavy burden we carry on our shoulders. But I know we always say together we can, because together definitely we can as Fijians, and uh, that's one thing that keeps us going. That encouragement, the team effort, and the prayers together, and even to the point the country praying behind us as well. I constantly get messages, and I constantly hear people saying, "Doc, we've got you covered. We've uh, we're praying for you guys." There's so much of those messages come my way, come our way, and those encouragements help us. They they keep us going, and they they definitely keep us moving. And um, and that translates back down to the ground as well. Them encouraging each other. So that's that's of essence right now. And I think together as a nation, we need to just be still and pray and uh, fight this fight together. So yeah. My final question is in relation to uh, post vaccination. What happens after people get vaccinated? Some people say, I can go back to my uh, previous uh, lifestyle of uh, drinking grog with uh, my friends and family members, etc. Uh, of course, things cannot be done in a hurry as many people have not been fully vaccinated. If you can talk about that, please. You know, that's, that's an important uh, thing to note. I mean, we all really want to go back to a normal lifestyle. And as Fijians, as Pacific Islanders, we're so... Um, you know, we miss our hugs. We miss uh, we miss those uh, handshakes. We miss those uh, moments. Uh, but uh, honestly, the time not is not there right now. We we will get there, and we'll get there together if we put pitch in this together in terms of getting our jabs done. And uh, right now, with having gotten both your doses, we still need. Remember, we we haven't even crossed fifty percent of our target population. We haven't eased down any uh, restrictions in place. We haven't eased off anything in terms of even mask wearing. Mm -hmm. We can't do that till we know a huge number of our population is protected. So, so I think it goes banks back onto all of us. I mean, if we can do this together and if we can shield up together and make uh, give that protection to this country, to our people, to our children as well, we will get to that stage. But as for now, not right now, not anytime soon. And we haven't even crossed that 70% mark for second dose. We're very far, uh, we're far off from it, but not much, we're just months away from it. But um, so I, th I think uh, we should hold back a bit. Um, we can do it, but eventually when the day is right, but the time is not right right now. 
So hold on to those uh, moments where you want to uh, hug your family, friends, and you know, um, and have a and, and have a session with them or something. But you know, it's it's uh, the time is not right right now. So even if you're fully protected with vaccination, remember there are others who aren't. And they, we remember what I've been saying is um, um, while we are jabbed, we can still be carriers and transmit the virus to others. So while we're at it, just protect yourself, protect the whole country, just do the right thing, be responsible. Remember that message, nothing in a hurry, please. We'll get you uh, that information when you can and that information will come through after people are vaccinated based on the target population. Dr. Rachel, thank you very much for your time. Uh, great work by the team on the ground, by the vaccination teams uh, going to the north this week. A lot of excited people up in Vanualevu will join you again next week. Thank you.